potassium pump. Okay, this is a this is a particular protein floating in the sea of lipids. Here's the lipids here. This particular protein um, that is a pump. So it uses metabolic energy to move ions across the membrane and is partly responsible for setting up the resting membrane potential. Positive on the outside, negative on the inside. An interesting factoid about this is that 40%, almost half of all your metabolic energy is spent doing that. Almost half of what you, the energy that you consume in the food that you eat is used to do that, to pump ions across membranes. And this pump exists in all of your cells, all of your cells, I think I mentioned this last time, all of your cells have a resting membrane potential. It's just the excitable cells, like neurons, that use that to send information. So what I'm going to show you here is the ions moving across the membrane. Using energy from ATP, sodium potassium pumps actively transport sodium ions out of the cell and potassium ions in, creating an uneven distribution of charge across the membrane. Some potassium channels are open all the time, allowing potassium ions to leave the cell. There's a variety of different types. As a result of these ion movements, the inside of the cell is negative relative to the outside. This condition is called the resting potential. The membrane of an axon is also packed with gated ion channels that open and close during... So this is a special kind of channel that's called the gated channel. And it's going to open and close depending upon the distribution of charges across the membrane. So you have positive out here and negative here. And you'll see in this graphic, as a change in membrane potential spreads in this direction, it will influence the, the structure of the gate. This gate will change its three-dimensional structure and it will open up and allow ions to move. And this is really very much what a gated channel looks like. This isn't just some flight of fancy, but biochemists have done structural analysis on these molecules and determined exactly how they're shaped. And it's interesting that in one aspect here, there's like a little ball in a chain, like you have on a drain. Well, that structure actually exists and looks like that. And when the gate closes, the stopper goes into the drain. It actually looks like that. Bring an action potential. At resting potential, the gated channels are closed. If a stimulus changes the distribution of charge across the membrane sufficiently, the gated sodium channels open. Movement of sodium ions across the membrane makes the inside of the cell more positive. So it flips to positive. This reversal of the charge distribution causes the gated sodium channels to close and the gated potassium channels to open. As potassium ions move out of the cell, the original charge difference is re-established across the membrane. So the sodium channel on the left is responsible for the initial change in the resting membrane potential. So the initial flip. So it's, it's positive on the outside, negative on the inside, and then the sodium ions move across the membrane and the membrane potential flips. And that's a result of this activity in the in the sodium channel. The potassium channel next to it now opens and potassium ions flow across the membrane and the membrane potential flips back to the initial condition so that it's positive on the outside and negative on the inside. And this flip-flop occurs along the length of the membrane so it spreads like a wave of activity and that's what's shown in the graphic here. closing the gated potassium channels. This sequence of events is called an action potential. The sodium potassium pump restores the distribution of ions back to their previous levels at resting potential. <laughs>
how the action potential is conducted along the axon. As the change in charge difference across the membrane spreads from open sodium channels, other sodium channels farther along the axon begin to open. The original sodium channels close and adjacent potassium channels open. As potassium ions move out of the cell, the original charge difference across the membrane is restored and then the potassium channels close. Meanwhile, new sodium channels open. Fu so what happens here, in, in, if you can imagine, in a little bit more detail, is that sodium ions flow in, positive ions flow in, and the inside of the cell becomes positive, outside negative, relative to one another. And then the potassium channel opens up, and positive potassium ions flow out, positive flows out. So now the inside goes back to negative and the outside is positive. So the flow of sodium is initially into the cell and reverses the resting membrane potential. And then the potassium channels open up, positive flows out, and brings the, the potential difference back to resting. In the meantime, the pump the sodium potassium pump is pumping all the time. You're expending that 40% of your metabolic energy all the time. It just becomes overwhelmed by the activity in these gated channels. Okay? So when the gated channels finally close, then there's just the pump there, pumping away, pumping away, and it reestablishes that resting membrane potential until another wave of activity comes through. It's sort of exhausting just thinking about it. by the opening of new potassium channels and the closing of sodium channels. In this manner, the action potential is propagated along the axon of the neuron, eventually reaching another cell. The information carried by this action potential will be prop... Okay, so here's this, this cell body, and this is the input region with all the dendrites, and here's an axon coming along and it's going to release neurotransmitter onto this input region, and then you're gonna get an action potential flowing down this axon to another neuron. So one neuron, second neuron, third neuron, okay? Um, I'm gonna be talking about this connection between one neuron and another. I mentioned it last week, the synapse, a very specialized junction that is a major control point because it's the signal going from one cell to another cell. In some instances, this signal is going from a nerve cell to a muscle cell to cause contraction. But here they're just showing one neuron to another neuron to another neuron. Okay? That junction is the object of a great deal of research how one cell communicates with another. And it's especially important uh, with regards to studies uh, on drugs and how drugs affect behavior and function. So the pharmaceutical companies put a lot of money into research and development to understand how a neuron controls its target and how to manipulate that if there's something wrong with that junction to either increase the activity or decrease the activity to strengthen the synapse or weaken the synapse, depending upon what, what you want as an outcome, okay? And this is exactly what happens when you learn something or you remember something or you commit it to memory, is that you change your synapses. You don't do this consciously. It's all a matter of, of and well, in a sense, you do it consciously, not on the, on the molecular level, but it's a result of, of sensory input, changing, literally changing the structure of your brain, or um, either, either strengthening connections or weakening connections. And in fact, in fact, you're sitting in this audience right now, and I, I am changing the structure of your brain. I've had students in the past go, oh, okay, I'm a professional. <laughs> That's what teachers do, right? Uh, and, and people that aren't so kind as well. Um, 
So by the, your, your synapses are being changed as you take in this information voluntarily. Or if you put your fingers in your ears, then not. This is just about over. Processed with other information, permitting this baseball player to make a spectacular catch. So in that case, uh, we're talking about the processing of sensory information. And in fact, just because I used to play baseball, um, the, it's interesting to think about that task. So you have an outfielder who is watching the batter and has a, a really short time to respond. If you think about that task, the pitcher throws the ball, and the batter hits the ball, and then the outfielder has to make a really fast decision. Is that ball, is the trajectory in this direction or in that direction? And so there's a, just a tiny bit of information, visual information, and then the outfielder runs in the, hopefully, otherwise he looks pretty bad, or she looks pretty bad, uh, you run in the direction of the tra trajectory, and you have to command all of those muscles to act appropriately so that your glove is in the correct position to catch the ball. It's interesting to think about the mechanisms that, that occur. So, so let's go back to the PowerPoint. specific genetic information that's in the fertilized egg, information from your father and from your mother. And it's also a function of things like diet and environment. So it's a product of nature and of nurture. Um, if you don't utilize pathways, then they'll never be strengthened. Let me go a little further along here. We talked about some specifics. Uh, okay, homeostasis, we talked about that. Chemical, electrical, structure of the neuron. Mm, that's good. Dendrite cell body axon, good. Synapse. Um, so here, here are these, here's an, an individual axon ending in axon terminals. And this is a blown up uh, diagram of this junction of the synapse with the axon terminal and its target cell. This could be another neuron, or it could be something like a muscle cell. Okay. What's important to note here is that uh, at this junction, the wave of ionic activity is transduced or transformed into the release of a chemical. And that chemical is called a neurotransmitter. And there are many different kinds of neurotransmitters. Uh, I mentioned some dopamine, zinc-choline, um, lots. Okay? So those are released into this uh, little space, very tiny little space, and they diffuse across, and then they bind to receptor molecules. And one of the things that these receptor molecules can do is change the flow of ions. They could be potassium channels, they could be sodium channels, there are other possibilities as well. But the point here is that one of the means of communication is, is um, secretion of this chemical and then a change in the target membrane to cause the movement or prevent the movement of ions, somehow to change the membrane potential of the target cell. Okay. And this, is, this would be the input region. So here are dendrites over here, right? So this is the input region here. This is the output at the synaptic terminal. And so the effect of the release of the neurotransmitter is to change the structure of the proteins in the target membrane and to change the way ions flow. It could be inhibitory. It could inhibit the target cell. 
or it could excite the target cell. Depends on which ions are flowing. And there's other kinds of possibilities of, of post-synaptic effects, but the, the, the release of this chemical is going to result in a wave of ionic activity in the target cell. And then you get to a potential that will trigger a, uh, an action potential or will inhibit the formation of an action potential. So this, just to go back to what I was saying last week, this region of input is uh, the dendrites in the cell body is sort of the analog region of the cell. So there's a resting membrane potential that you can vary a little bit depending upon this input. And then the trigger zone at the beginning of the axon is where it's determined um, whether or not you get an action potential or not. Okay? And that's where you go from analog, continuously varying current or potential to digital action potential or no action potential. So the uh, terminology here, the, on the uh, output end of the first neuron, that's called the presynaptic neuron. And then the target is called the postsynaptic neuron. And then the neurotransmitters released between the two of them. And then there are receptors, very specific proteins in the membrane of the postsynaptic or target cell that are going to change the flow of ions. Ah. You may have heard uh, of the term myelin because there are diseases that uh, result in a loss of myelin. Myelin is really interesting. It's, it's insulation. So if you look at an electrical wire, you'll see that there's a coating, a plastic coating or rubber coating of some type that's going to prevent shorting out of the wire, of the electrical wire. And myelin serves a very similar purpose. Uh, it prevents the neuron from shorting out so that the action potential spreads from the threshold region all the way down the axon to the axon terminal. And it goes very fast. Not all of your nerves are myelinated. Oops. Not all of them are myelinated, but a lot of them are. Especially the, the neurons that drive the musculature to make the catch. Those are definitely myelinated. So let's talk a little bit about the development of the nervous system. So you, you start out as a single cell. That's a combination of the genetic information from your parents. Right? But a single cell, and then two cells, and four cells, and eight cells, and 16. And these cells begin to organize themselves in very specific ways based on the information, the genetic information in the cells. In the nervous system, a tube is formed, a tube-like structure. So there's a lumen, or a, a space, surrounded by cells, like a pipe. Okay? And in that pipe is what will be cerebral spinal fluid. So you may know that you have fluid spaces in your brain. Okay? And it starts out as the, the space or the lumen of a tube surrounded by cells. And this tube begins to bend in various ways and expand, the walls begin to expand based on the genetic program. And of course, whether or not this embryo and fetus is being supplied with sufficient food and a good diet during the pregnancy. If it isn't, then the nurture isn't going to work and the genetic program is not going to be fulfilled. So now you've got nature and nurture, once again. So there's a variety of different bends that go on, and you get the, the folds in the surface of the brain, the characteristic um, um, organization of the brain. And one thing I'll mention here is that as the young nerve cells divide, they migrate. This is in the films that you're looking at. So they migrate from one place to another, and that migration is based on the genetic plan. 
So they're fulfilling that information that's present in the nucleus. They're reading it out and moving accordingly from one place to another from the um, uh, from a, a, an initial location to an adult location, if you want to think about it that way. So they position themselves in very specific ways. So certain parts of your brain have particular functions, like the back of your brain is a region that processes um, visual information, and the side over here, the temporal portion of your brain, processes auditory information. That's based on the early migration of these cells to specific locations. So here's a, a little scheme of, of, of fetal development. So you start out as, as what's called the zygote, uh, an individual cell, and then you get cell divisions, and you're, you're in the first few months, you're a, um, an embryo, and then you're referred to as a fetus, a little bit more sophisticated kind of anatomy and function. Uh, synapse, synapses begin to form very early on, so the functional, structural and functional connections between neurons begin to form. Um, you get uh, motor activity in the second trimester, and sensory pathways begin to form in the third trimester. So you're building on the complexity, on the structure and the complexity of the nervous system throughout the pregnancy. Visual and other systems start to mature, and what that means um, basically is that the nerves are becoming, the axons are becoming myelinated so that they can transmit the signals faithfully, they don't short out, and they can transmit them quickly from one region to another. So you're beginning to accumulate vast amounts of sensory information, even before you're born. But certainly when you're exposed to the external environment and all the sounds and the uh, and the smells and the visual input, then it really starts to flood in. This is a, an, an interesting point uh, to think about, and that is that you tend to think about remembering things. You're in, you're in college, so you have to remember a whole lot of things, um, but you sort of focus on that, and that's reasonable. But you also have to forget things. If you were continually processing all the information that was coming in through your sensory systems as you drove on Highway 280 this morning, if you were continuing to do that, you would be flooded. You, you, you couldn't concentrate on what you have to do. You'd be overwhelmed with information. And so somehow those memories are lost. So those connections are ramped down and new connections are made. There's way too much information coming in at you. And I, and I think in, the, uh, in the, the baby brain, they talked about uh, premature, uh, the example of a premature baby, and um, you don't get normal development. Um, you have to be very careful about normal development with premature babies because they're, they're not able to process all, all this information that's coming in. They're out of the womb too early. So they create an environment in intensive care that's a lot quieter and, and different in other ways to reduce the sensory input so that the baby's brain can develop um, ways in which to handle all this information. Myelination is beginning early on, and it's not really completed until you're in your 20s. So you're not fully capable um, until you're in your 20s with regards to myelination. You'll be capable in lots of other ways, but not in this way. Ah, now. Um, I put in a few extra things in yellow on these, and I'll give this to Michael, but you can also make those. Those are extra added in, okay? Um, all of these systems are beginning to develop. There are particular brain regions which are devoted to these capacities, uh, language, memory, 
Uh, and here I mentioned that you make more synapses, but you may ramp down or make fewer synapses in some cases because you, you're releasing some of these memories, like the information from the highway this morning. You want to get rid of that. You don't need, you might want to know some of it, but not all of it. Um, and stronger synapses. Now, what does that mean? What are stronger? More synapses, okay, that kind of makes sense. You just make more contact. Okay, and in, in, a, in a given motor neuron that controls muscle, you may have, in the input region, you may have a quarter of a million synapses. That's a huge amount of possible input to an individual neuron. And has to put all that information together, and then do you get action potentials or don't you get action potentials? So there's a huge amount of information processing that goes on by an individual neuron to determine whether or not action potentials are going to happen. Okay. So you can make more synapses, more contacts, and that makes, I think, intuitive sense. But you can also make stronger synapses. What does that mean? And this is where the pharmaceutical companies come in, and basic research, definitely. But they want to know how to strengthen synapses or weaken them. And to control the strength of a synapse, you can do things like increase the amount of neurotransmitter that's being released. That would make a stronger effect on the target cell. Or you could make the, the contact region of an individual synapse larger. So it's releasing neurotransmitter over a greater area of the target. Or you could increase or decrease the number of, of postsynaptic receptors. So you can make the target cell more sensitive to the release of neurotransmitter. So there's a bunch of different ways that you can change the structure of the synapse to make it stronger or weaker, depending on what you need to do. These tasks, there's a lot known about where these are localized in the brain. Nobody knows anything about that. You develop a sense of self, but what, what is that? It's important. Synapses are sculpted. I have a really cool quote that, uh, at the end of the lecture that I'm going to give you that, that makes a reference to this that I just ran across the other day. Pretty cool. You can, you can strengthen synapses, like when you learn a motor skill, as you repeat the skill, you strengthen the synapses. You may be increasing the amount of neurotransmitter, you may be increasing the amount of postsynaptic receptors. A variety of different ways to do that, but as you repeat the task. And it's interesting, I think, that when you learn a motor skill, like skiing, you think about it as you do it. Where are my skis? Where's my weight? Leaning forward, backwards, where's my center of gravity? You think about it, right? Or if you're learning to dance, it's the same thing. I'm not very good at that. You, move your, you think about where your feet are, and you look down, and you look at your feet when you're learning. But at some point, you, you have the circuitry done with regards to that particular skill. And if you think about it while you're doing it, you're going to screw up. So when you dance, you're not learning to dance, but when you dance, you don't think about it. When you ski, you work down hill, you don't think. You may think about certain things, but it's very different from when you're learning the task and building the circuitry and strengthening the synapses. Uh, so, 
in, in teenage years, the, the systems that have to do with, with reasoning, emotion, attention, all of these things are still maturing in the sense of myelination and strengthening and weakening of synapses. So you're still a work in progress. And as the, the video indicates, uh, you're being hit by, by a cascade of um, hormonal changes. And you have to deal with all of that. That's not easy. So here's some new. In the teen years, there's, there are all of these challenges going on, and your nervous system isn't, is, is developing, right? Um, in schizophrenia, in the, in the video, they talk about how there's no real obvious changes in brain structure. There's no damage. It might be that the fluid spaces are a little bit larger, and so your brain is pushed a bit against your skull from the inside. So maybe the amount of tissue that's devoted to, to a variety of different processes might be a bit smaller, but it's not completely clear. One of the things in the video that I think is, is quite interesting is when they talk about the idea that um, you don't see with your eyes and you don't hear with your ears. You do that with your brain. And so it's possible to bypass the sensory input from the outside and internalize everything. Am I close? Ten minutes. Um, and so in, in schizophrenia, one of, the, one of the characteristics of schizophrenia is hallucinations, of seeing things that aren't there. Okay. And that's a matter of the internal stimulation of regions of the brain that are responsible for vision or hearing. It's not input from the outside, necessarily. Um, they talk about the addiction pathways. Okay? And addiction has to do with pathways um, concerning reward. Um, dopamine is a major neurotransmitter, and the drugs of addiction will mimic neurotransmitters, like dopamine. There may be more neurotransmitter released as a result of intake of drugs, and so you feel good. But one of the results of an increase in the release of neurotransmitter of, or of that kind of activity is that the postsynaptic receptors are removed or reduced. That's called downregulation. And so in order to have the same effect, you need more of the drug. So the synapse begins to reform itself because it's receiving, a, it's receiving this drug or more neurotransmitter, and it decreases its activity. And the result is the addiction gets stronger, and you need more of the drug to get the effect. Memory systems start to decline in their 20s. I mentioned that last time. Uh, myelination continues in the early 20s and into the 20s. Here, in the aging brain, one of the things I thought was, was uh, very hopeful um, is the relationship between capacity or capability and exercise. I thought that was really interesting. They showed a gentleman who was in his 90s and he was pumping away doing, doing sit-ups and, and push-ups. And they attributed that to something called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF. And that's a, that's a chemical that causes cells to divide. So you can replace some of the brain cells that may have withered away and maintain your capacity if you maintain exercise. You have plasticity throughout your life. Um, and they talked about Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Parkinson's has to do with a loss of a specific set of neurons that controls motor programs. So you have a lot of motor issues um, and a decrease in capacity. That can be alleviated to a certain extent by drugs, um, but uh, it's, neither of these things can be cured. Alzheimer's is, of course, the second. And in the, in the video, they talk about tangles and plaques, and these are 
um, um, a result of changes in the architecture of individual neurons so that they, they get tangled up, literally, that's what it looks like. And then there's the deposition of substances called beta amyloid to form plaques or smudges within the brain and that interferes with function. Uh, there's some interesting uh, advances in research with regards to both of these that the videos talk about, and that's, um, that's also very helpful. Okay, and then I'm going to finish there with my, with my quote. And I talked about Santiago Ramon Cajal last time in his going battle to Camilo Golgi. And um, uh, forgive the, the sexist sort of implication here. Uh, this is back in the beginning of the 20th century. So every man, if he so desires, or she, right, can become the sculptor of his own brain. So you, your, that's your task right now, actually, is to reform your brain so that you, you can become a lifelong learner, so that you know how to take in information and process it. Pretty cool. Adios, do you have any questions? No? No? Okay. Continue <laughs> me.